No real reason. Just because it's Monday. Yeah, that's true. If it was just for that reason, no, I don't know. I wear shorts, you know, with just a suit jacket on top. <laughs> I was wondering if newscasters do that. They probably do in some cases, especially when they're in areas where it's warm, too. Right. They still have a north to park. Okay, I went to the wrong place. All right, today we're going to talk about images. We're going to spend a minute talking about the role that they play on web pages. Or I should rephrase that, the roles that they play on web pages. Because you put images on your web page for a number of different reasons. It might seem obvious, but there's actually several reasons you might put images on your page. What will be a reason to put an image on your page? Just appearance, aesthetics. To draw attention. That's good. Draw attention. Symbol to the title or Okay. Uh, I, I like that. Uh, let's think of a, a way to say that. To, yeah. to let's, say, let's think of a, a, another way to do it. Um, Branding is, is one way to say it, like with companies, all right? To evoke the mood of the page might be another way to say it. Um, We want our web pages to look good. We might do certain things, show the importance of it, draw people's attention. We might want to brand the page and and or at the very least create a sense of mood, like what is this page about? So the image sort of um, resonates with the other content on the page. You know, if you, uh, if you had a page about, uh, if you were opening a Halloween store, you wouldn't have an image of like flowers and Cupid and stuff like that, right? You'd have skulls and pumpkins and that kind of thing. Uh, whereas vice versa for Valentine's Day. I don't know, maybe the Adams Family though would have the skulls and pumpkins and all that, but everyone else would have that. The other thing I would say, I think, these are, I think these are three really good reasons. The other thing I would say is that um, images in themselves are a form of content. All right, we talk about content mainly as being a, uh, as being text, but images themselves, you know, the old saying a picture is worth a thousand words. Could you imagine if you were, you know, if you wanted to, you know, if you're doing a web page about the Cavs championship a few years back, you could talk about how the streets of downtown were filled with people and they were celebrating and running around and hugging and high-fiving each other and all that. If you had an image that actually shows you that, that's a nice, concise way of expressing the content that you want to get across. Uh, other kinds of things would be like a diagram of something or um, like if I was going to describe how to um, change the tires on your bicycle, you know, I could explain how to do that in words, but a few key pictures here and there probably would go a long way in making the content a lot better um, and so on. So these are all reasons for putting pictures and images on our page. Uh, where can you get images from? Where can you get images to put on your web page? Uh, the web? Well, When we get images from the web, how do we know how 
whether or not we can actually use them on another website or not. Well, hold on, we'll discuss that. Sources for images. From the web. Um, the answer to that is a sorta. We can because we are in a classroom environment. So if you're taking that question literally, how can you get images for your projects, on the web is OK, provided you meet certain requirements. All right? It has to be in an educational context. You could not even make a personal web page and put it out there uh, and use images off the web. Strictly speaking, that would be a violation of copyright. Uh, that SpongeBob meme that you posted to Facebook, all right, that is a copyright violation. All right, now I know no one enforces it, but we're talking about what the law actually says. All right, in an educational context, you can use things provided you follow some guidelines. And it's similar to the guidelines that you might have if you're talking about like quoting a paper. Like if you're writing a, a term paper on something, you might quote another paper. You might quote someone's book. You're allowed to do that within certain guidelines. And if you look in the week one folder, we have a fair use guide handout that you can take a minute to read. And it talks about all different kinds of media that you can use, not just images. For example, in an educational context, you could use an audio clip provided it was no more than 10% or 30 seconds of the content. So if there was a song that was three minutes long, uh, you could not exceed 18 seconds because three minutes is 180 seconds. 10% of that is 18 seconds. So it's 10% or 30 seconds, um, whichever one is shorter. Um, if you had a hour-long musical piece that was 60 minutes long, 10% of that would be six minutes. Well, then you'd be limited by the 30-second rule. Images, illustrations, photos, it's probably most relevant from our perspective no more than five by an artist. And say for our purposes, we could consider that five from a, a source, five from a web page. You're only allowed to have a copy of an original. So you can't, you actually are not allowed to make a bunch of backups. Do keep in mind a lot of this is uh, also with regards to print stuff as well. And here's the most important thing, attribution. Give credit for where you got it from. So if you get an image from the Cleveland Browns website to celebrate their triumphant tie yesterday, all right, and put it up uh, on, on your web page, you should say image from www.clevelandbrowns.com or whatever their, their website is. So give attribution. So don't take too much and give credit where you got it from. And remember that these are the guidelines for educational websites, websites done in the classroom, not for websites that you'd actually put up on the web. Even if you had a personal site or if you had a small mom and pop sporting goods store or whatever, you could not take pictures from the Cleveland Browns website, uh, strictly speaking. Now again, I'm not talking about whether they enforce it or not. That's not the debate here. We're talking about what the letter of law is, so we're, we're sticking true to that. So when I take images, if I forget, remind me to, to go in and copy the source of the image and put it on the page. So long way around, but to answer the question, we can take pictures from the web provided we give attribution. All right. Other people can't just do that, can't just take them from the web. So how are other ways that you could get images for your website? You can take them yourself. What does it take to copyright an image that you took? What do you have to do to, 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 to have the copyright for an image that you've taken? Uh, 
yeah, that's another that's another issue that doesn't really relate to, to to copyright. But if I were if I were just to take a selfie, what would I have to do to have the copyright for that? Absolutely nothing. The minute you snap a picture, you own the copyright. Now the question becomes: Are you able to to prove that in the court of law? So people sometimes do legal things to guarantee that their copyright um, uh, claim will be honored. You know. <laughs> yeah, picture yourself taking a picture. But then who would own the copyright of that? Wow, it's getting complicated. So yeah, you can take pictures yourself. What's the advantage of taking pictures of yourself? Of, of, nah, did, I, did I say of yourself? Uh, all right, I didn't mean that. What are the advantages of taking pictures by yourself? You know, taking your own pictures. They're original, They're original so there's no question of copyright. Only you have access to them? Only you have access to them, sure. Well, not if you think. Well, uh, well. <laughs> Yes, you can take a picture exactly of what you want. For example, if I was uh, hired to do a website for Lorain County Community College uh, and I wanted a picture of the nice fountain out there, I could walk out there, I could get the exact picture I wanted of the fountain. All right, and there you go. Yes? Can you commission some for a photo or an illustration or drawing or whatever? Does that mean that when you buy it, you have the copyright, or does that still belong to the well, that's an interesting question. Let's hold off on that on a second, for a second. Let's say you're just taking a picture yourself. So if you take the picture yourself, you're absolutely right. You would theoretically get the exact picture you wanted, and you own the copyright for it, so you're in business. What is the downside of doing that? It may not be the quality. Yeah, and why may not it be the quality that you want? Because we're not professional Right, right. So... The benefit of this is getting exactly what you want. So that's the advantages. The quality might not be as good because you're not probably a pro photographer. And the other thing that could potentially affect the quality is what? The equipment. Yeah, you might not have the best equipment. So you might have a great eye for taking photographs, but you know, when professional photographers take a portrait, for example, they do all kinds of things with lighting and, you know, um, like that. So. The other thing I would say is, is it might not be really feasible to do that. Um, you know, uh, talking about taking a picture here on campus, you know, Lorain Community College uh, might be one thing, but if you were taking something, if you wanted a picture of something far away or something that was difficult to get or whatever, that might be hard to do that. Um, all right, we mentioned another one is, is hiring someone or commissioning. A photographer. All right. What are the upsides and the downsides for that? The upsides is you probably will get good quality provided you you know, hired a good photographer. You know, there's bad photographers in the world. So, uh, but if you hired a good photographer, you should have good equipment. You should get a, a, a good quality picture. Be careful on the downside. Be careful of the contract and what you're right. to. Because sometimes you only get that a copy of the print and not the right to use it. Exactly. Um, to answer your question a while ago, who owns the copyright if you commission someone? It's what you negotiate. It's what the contract says when you, when you hire them. So make sure you're very clear if, if it is to do that. Like for, just to give a, a, a goofy example, like, the, like pictures that, you, like, that they take of you when you finish a race. You actually just get the picture. The person, the photographer retains the, the, the copyright. So you couldn't, strictly speaking, at least the ones that I've seen, you couldn't put those um, on a website. 
All right, or like school pictures even for kids. I think that you just literally get the pictures of those. Uh, and so that would be a downside. What's another downside of that? Cost money. Yeah, it's going to cost. All right. So, you know, if I were a picture of the fountain, it's a balancing act. You know, do I think I can take a picture good enough to appear on a website of the fountain out there with my Android whatever it is? Um, I'm guessing yeah. I'm guessing yeah, because we're not talking about a print for the Museum of Modern Art where it would have to have excellent resolution and perfect shadows, lights, composition, all that. We're talking about a, a picture for a website and probably not even a gigantic picture, probably just a small picture. So yeah, I'll bet I could do that. So. I, if I, were I doing that, I would probably go out there and do that. Now, if we wanted a, a if we wanted a portraits of the uh, administration here, well, then I don't know. Maybe it would be beneficial to hire a photographer to take that because we would want top quality pictures. Um, I'm not a portrait photographer, um, therefore I'm not really sure I could do uh, the subjects justice and so on. So it's a plot, you know pluses and uh, minuses for both. What are other ways to obtain images? Yes? There are uh, royalty-free sites like Shutterstock and iStock. Okay. There are, there are uh, stock photography sites. And maybe the agreement is that it's royalty-free. What does that mean? Royalty-free. for them, you can use them without charge. So for example, if I were to, uh, if I were to record a rec, you know, record a, a, uh, a set of music and I wanted to burn CDs and sell it, if I bought an image royalty free, they wouldn't get like a dime per CD. I would pay them $200 and then I could print up as many CDs as, as I want. This is just known as stock photography. In other words, with stock photography, um, there are images available for a lot of very common scenes, probably more scenes than you could think of. There's a stock pho photograph for it. That used to actually be really big business for photographers, all right? Because let's say, you know, one of the advantages of taking a picture yourself or, or commissioning a photographer is you get exactly what you want. All right? So if I wanted a picture of one of the professors here on campus working out on the gym to show, hey, we have a gym here at LC. All right? And so I could put that, post that on a page about, like, you know, uh, living healthy and getting enough exercise and things like that. I might go and take that picture myself. If I really didn't care who the picture was of, or it didn't have to take place in LC's gym, if I just wanted to create a page promoting exercise, just any picture of anyone exercising might be good enough, right? So rather than hiring a photographer who's gonna charge a lot, I might go to a stock photography site and look up a picture of someone riding an exercise bicycle. And I would buy it. It would be cheaper than commissioning it myself but I'd still get a good quality work. It might not be exactly what I want, but it might be close enough. So let's look at some stock photography sites. In the old days, before the web, um, this was big business for a lot of photographers because they were the sort of the keepers of quality photography. Yes? Yes, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, because um, that's kind of the last way, uh, the, or not, I won't say the last way, but that's kind of the last way we're going to discuss for getting images. If I look up stock photography, we can go and we can go to place, 
plans start at $29 a month, and you know if you were if you did a lot of publishing, $29 per month probably would be nothing for you. Let's look for exercise bike. And here's a picture. Here's a picture. Here's a picture in a spinning class. Here's a picture, and so on. These are all quality pictures, right? So, if I didn't care who the picture was of, and I didn't care that it was actually taken at Lorain County Community College's gym, and I just wanted a picture to go along with my story about exercising is good, all right, one of these pictures might do the trick. Let's see how much it would cost. Oh, and they have other pictures to go along with it. Uh, let's see. Exactly. Okay. So if you download 10 images a month, you'll pay $2.90 per image. If you download 50 images a month, you'll pay $99 per month, and so on down the line. Sorry, Jessica. If you just want to download two images, you can get them for $29. So, I guarantee to hire a professional photographer to take that quality of a picture, all right, it is going to be a lot more expensive than $29, all right? You don't, get it, you don't get it taken in Lorain County Community College's gym. You don't get the person that you want if you wanted a particular person. But you might get, uh, but you would get a high quality image and it would be a lot cheaper. Yes? What's preventing people from just using the SNP tool on their computer and just taking it? Pardon me? What's, what's preventing them from just using like the SNP tool and stealing these images? Well, the, the, the... Well, yeah, but when you scroll down, you'll notice that like, None of these have them. So if you were to use the SNP tool and just cut it out. They use HTML on the website. You can see, you can click the right click any picture. You can get around all of that, though. Um, I guess you could use a SNP tool. I think the idea is that uh, that is a small enough low quality image that they're not really concerned about it. Yeah. Okay, now, sort of the last, and I, again, I don't want to necessarily take all day about this, but I think it's important to consider this because usually, you know, uh, you know, it's an important topic. Um, it's practical for this class, right, you know, because you, you probably will want images on your page, all right, and you should know what the law is if you're going to use pages. We don't want the FBI bursting in the lab. All right. I actually did have the FBI burst in the lab once, and I was, was terrified because they wanted to speak to me. All right? And all my, my classes were like, oh, my God, what did he do? You know? As it turned out, they were doing a background check for one of my former students, and they wanted to ask me some questions. And I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawbreaker. You know? Not, you know, it may, you know, maybe I have come to a rolling stop at a stop sign, but that hardly seems to be something to send the FBI out for, right? You know, uh, but yeah, yeah, it was, and, and I'll tell you, the guy looked exactly like you would picture an FBI agent in movies, like the perfectly cut hair, the perfectly fine business suit, the shirt tucked in. Exactly. I mean, he was he was just out of the the TV shows and and uh, yeah, yeah, he did because I really don't remember much after he walked in. No, I'm just. <laughs> uh, and it was kind of weird too because I remembered the students sort of. But, like, you know, I have a lot of students every semester, you know? And it wasn't even like it was, like, the last semester. It was, like, three or four semesters ago. So it's like, yeah, I kind of remember them. And it's like, you know, did he, did, did he indicate that he was, an, you know, did, he, did any of his work indicate that he was anti-American? And I'm like, no, not really, you know? A web page about HTML, that's not really, you know, very 
political, you know, but, but, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 maybe I should check people's comments a little closer. <laughs> at, at any rate, at any rate, um, yeah, I had a company in Silicon Valley stated that to get someone clear to do uh -huh. work sometimes cost as much as 80000 Wow. For the very reason, because they do go out right, and right, right. everything about you. They can go into neighbors' houses. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I've had like minor background checks because I did, I worked at a part of uh, summer fellowship for NASA, so they did some sort, but that was like a, a 10 week thing, so I don't think they, I mean, they didn't like let me have any secrets or anything. I didn't, they didn't let me go to Area 51 or anything, so, uh, you know, so. Maybe I did. Maybe I did, yeah, all right. Uh, all right, anyhow, copyright doesn't last forever, by the way. Uh, at a certain point, uh, your copyright expires. The whole idea of copyright is to make sure that whoever creates the image and their heirs can, can get a reasonable amount of money for it. So if I, you know, take a great photo or paint something or write a piece of music, I'm entitled to earn money off that for a certain period of time, and then my heirs are entitled to it. And that fluctuates depending on what country you live in and it has changed over time. Uh, let's look to see what, pardon me? Yeah, let's see what the current copyright period is for stuff. All right, the length of copyright would depend on which law was affected at the time, the 1909 or, you knew this wasn't going to be a straightforward answer, right? Like, like it's 40 years, you know. So, the easy cases. If the work was published before 1923, it's in the public domain. All right, so let's go. Yeah, just do old stuff, right. <laughs> Photograph of Abraham Lincoln. Public domain. is who took the photograph, who had the copyright on it. Because all these people are simply using a photograph that's in the public domain. How do you know it's public domain? Well, this is what this is saying. If it's published before 1923, it's in the published uh, domain. If, if you were looking at a photograph and you weren't sure when it was published, would you be able to know that it was uh, public domain? Uh, not, in, not unless they, they told you, if they identified it, and, and you trusted the source that told you that it was. All right, if the work was published after 1963, its copyright has not expired. So take a more recent picture. Uh, any photo of LeBron James is not, the copyright is not expired of it. How long does the copyright last? It depends. Blah, 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 blah. You can't term will last or whether it's expired if you don't know when it's published. And here's a bunch of legal stuff. All right. Anything done after 1976, author's life plus 70 years. It's actually a long time. Yeah, it might, it might be different depending on that. Uh, uh, from what I hear, Walt Disney wouldn't have been allowed to make a lot of his movies um, like that were based on fairy tales if the current copyright law was in effect because they were written in the 1800s and the person would have still had the copyright uh, on them. But at any rate, um, now that's how things automatically get put in the public domain. I could take a picture now and declare that I don't retain my copyright for it. It's in the public domain. So you could just put stuff in the public domain. All right? So that would be a second way that it gets put in there. In which case, when I publish it, I would say I don't retain the copyright. 
The last thing, last option that you have is something called Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is sort of a clever solution to where you can, you as a creator of a work, can identify what uses people can make of it and what uses people can't make of it. So, let's look up Creative, creative Commons licensing. You can specify oh, there's a whole bunch of things here and a bunch of symbols. I was hoping for a nice simple chart here, but in a nutshell, you can specify. If something is personal use, commercial use, whether you can derive work from it, and action. I think that's like the four things that you can control. So I can say that, hey, I took a picture of Niagara Falls and it's free for personal use. So you want to make a invitation to a party at Niagara Falls, go ahead. You can do it. Personal use. You're not a business. All right. Or I can say it's also available for commercial use, which is like, hey, I don't care if you run a business. You can use this photograph. All right. You can say if derivative work are allowed from it. So well, essentially that means is can I use my, can I use that image? And images are what we're talking about, so that's what I'm talking about here. But it would also apply to music and, and other, other artistic work. Can I make a collage that includes that picture? That would be a derivative work. All right. Can I take my photo of Niagara Falls and Photoshop me in a canoe going over the, the, the edge of it? That's a derivative work. And then finally, typically, all these Creative Commons licenses require some form of attribution um, that state who took it, you know, who owns the copyright for it. Now, how do you find Creative Copy stuff? You can find it a couple different ways. For one thing, if you do a Google search. Let's search for Niagara Falls. And let's look at images. Oh, I didn't know there were, there were three A's in Niagara Falls. All right. These are all images of Niagara Falls. Which ones have copyright on them? No idea. I can go to Tools and filter under Usage Right and say, what are the ones that are labeled for Reuse with modification, labeled for reuse, labeled, these are really the different levels of Creative Commons license. This will be the absolute least restrictive. Even commercial companies can do it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This would be labeled, anyone could use it and it would be, you're allowed to modify it. There's still a fair number of images here. Now, the advantages and disadvantages of this are similar to stock photography with a couple differences. If you can find a Creative Commons license picture, you get it for free. All right? Whereas a stock photography picture, even if you only pay a little bit, you're going to pay something. Now, probably the stock photography picture might be of better quality, maybe. But you can find some really good pictures of um, 
that are licensed by Creative Commons as well. Especially considering what you're going to be using it for. If you're going to be using it and it's not going to be a high resolution picture or whatever, then hey, that's pretty cool, right? Um, does it need to be perfect? It's not like, again, you're, you're, you're printing posters that you're going to sell with it. All right. So, let's take You can also search sites such as Flickr and filter for for uh, non uh, for uh, Creative Commons pictures as well. So let's search here for Niagara Falls. I was there last week. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you should. Have, yeah, there you go. And, and from here, any license, I can say uh, no restrictions. So here's an example with no known copyright restrictions. This is something you can take um, without um, having to pay someone. You, you, they've already, they sort of pre-approved the use of it. They, might, they own the copyright to it, but they've said it's okay to use. Yes. Yes. If I said commercial, if, if that modification is allowed one. So let's look at this picture, and let's take it. Typically, yes. So I'm going to download. And I'm going to download a medium version of it. All right. So I have that on the desktop. So I guess that's what our web page is today. A web page about Niagara Falls. Okay. So let's go in. Let's create a web page. It, it doesn't matter. Okay. I'm going to rename this picture tonight simply because I don't want to deal with that giant image name. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put my basic web tags here. And we might have a picture that or we might explains what Niagara Falls is. Okay, we'll just leave that as a paragraph. So now I want to put 
uh, that image there. So the question is, how do I put an image there? There is an image tag, which is IMG. All right. Now, just like a link, it's not enough to say I have an image, right? Because what's the image of? My website might have hundreds of images on it. And as far as the web goes, there's billions of images on the web. So we have to specify what image we're talking about. What image do we want to show here? Now, I'm going to apply the same rule as I did when I talked about linking to another one of your web pages. If it's in the same folder as your code, which I'm going to say both these on the desktop, then all I need to do is say this, src equals, and then the name of the picture. Now, a couple things about that. It has to be the name of the picture, including the file extension. The file extension are the three letters that are added. This machine is set to show those three letters, not all machines are. If they're not, if you're on a machine where it's not set to show the file extension, you have to turn the exception on by going to Options under View and Show or, or unclick this one that says hide extensions for known file types. Because if I click that, it just shows me Niagara. And I don't know the full name of the file. Images can have a number of different extensions, depending on the kind of image they are. Images can be JPEG files, which is a, simply a way of compressing the data in them. Now, JPEG files can end in a .jpg or .jpeg. So you need to know the exact name. So it's important to go in and make sure that the extensions are being shown. So you can put that in. So that's how I know it's Niagara.jpg. The other thing that we're going to do, we're going to have a second attribute for this. All right? Second attribute for this is what's called the alt attribute. And the alt attribute is a brief description of the photo that will help people that are blind, that can't see the photo, explain to them what the photo is of. Now, it's not going to be a long description, but Maybe I'll say picture of Niagara Falls. Now, the image is sort of different than other pictures in that it doesn't really need an end tag. So I'm just going to do this and end the start tag. I don't absolutely need an end tag for this. So now I'm going to save this as a web page. And I'll call it Niagara. And I'll put it on the desktop. And now, I have my image and my HTML page. If I open it up, I get my web page with the image on it. Now, one last thing I should do. I should give credit to the person that did it. Here we go. And I'm just going to copy this 
and I'm going to put it underneath the image. I'll just leave the URL right now as it as it is. and it shows the URL. I'll do that right now. Next week, or next, not next week, but next class, I'll talk about maybe how we could do a better job doing that. But I do want to remember where I got it from so that I can correctly cite it next week. Any questions about this? Yes? An image tag doesn't require an ending tag. So it's just a starting tag. We'll talk about some options you have with that next time as well. Now again, this would be a case of I would say this, this image is a form of content because it gives you a better idea of what Niagara Falls is than trying to describe it's a, just a really big waterfall. Yes? Uh, where's the alt um, tag? Like, where can you see that? Uh, you can't. All right. You can see it under a couple conditions. If the image was missing, you would see the alt attribute. Also, if someone was reading the page, if someone was using screen reader software to read the page to them. Uh, we'll talk about web accessibility later on in the term, but there's actually software that reads the web page to them. And if that was the case, it would read the alt attribute. Yes? Yes, there is. We'll talk about that next time. Because you actually have, you know, that's the thing. You have options for, like, everything, all right? You know, how you do a particular thing, you know, um, we, could, we could size it in an editor. We could size it via CSS. There's a lot of ways we could size it. So we'll talk about some of that stuff next time. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not prepared to say that. All right. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, just do, do your best, you know. I mean, and you're only responsible for the stuff we've covered in class. So if it, if it isn't perfect, if it at least follows the stuff that's in class, then, then you'll be okay. But if, you know, some people go the extra mile, do a little extra research, ask me questions in lab, and, and do that. So I'm not ready to concede that it's not going to be a really nice-looking web page. All right. That's all we had today. We'll see you up in lab.